Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in the C++ series. If you can believe it or not, we're at like part 10 here talking about classes, but we're going to talk a little bit more about something known as the rule of five or the law of five or the big five. So let's go ahead and look at a little bit of an example and also review what we've seen in some of the other previous lessons very quickly, just so that I can bring you up to space and teach you about this rule of five. All right, so I've got an example prepared here, which I've prepared a class in the upper left hand corner called int array. It's in its own header file, so it has its own interface, and I've defined here the big three. That is the constructor, which for this one, it's going to take in a name so that we can identify which objects are being created in today's example. A destructor, which destroys the resources. So again, reviewing our concept of resource acquisition is initialization. We acquire or allocate memory here, and then we free that resource in the destructor. And the final part, or the final part of the big three is the copy constructor here, where we can make a copy. And often I also include the copy assignment operator for after an object has been created, if you want to make a copy of it from an already existing object. All right, so if those three items are clear to you, then we can go ahead and uh, move on. Otherwise, I recommend checking out some of the previous videos in this series so you can get up to speed. Now, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is go ahead and walk us through some of the implementation code. So again, here's the constructor and I've used a member initializer list. Also a review here where I've created the name. This might be a little bit new where I'm allocating one of the member variables M data here, which is just a raw pointer for now by just allocating an array of 10 integers here. So that's our data that we're working with with this user defined type here called int array. So this is another neat trick that you can do and just allocate the memory here in your memory initializer list. All right, and then I've also added some labels here so that I can just see when these functions are being called. Again, that's something I recommend doing as a beginner. Our destructor frees the memory here, being careful to use the bracket notation to make sure that we delete the entire array. And then if I go down here to our copy constructor, you'll see that I'm assigning the name of our current instance of an object to the right hand side here. And then I can go ahead and print out that the copy constructor is being called or allocating memory and just assigning each element of the array here one item at a time. And again, there's different tricks you could use with memcopy and so on to do this a little bit faster, but this is just explicitly showing what's going on. And you're going to notice that the copy assignment operator looks very, very similar. This idea that I am assigning the names here. Um, now, one small correction here. Let me go ahead and just move this um, down here where we're actually doing the name assignment here. Because, again, remember that we have to be a little bit careful to make sure that we're not assigning an object to itself. So we go ahead and make sure to check that this instance of the object, that is the actual memory location of the object, is not equal to the right hand side. Now it might be a little bit more uh, interesting for me to just show you if I have some int array here that's represented by some memory location. I want to make sure that it's not equal to, well, whatever the address of this object is. So 775 or something, um, that would be the uh, this uh, pointer. So I'll just put uh, this here, but make sure that whatever I'm trying to assign it to is not also the same object, 775. So you'll see that in code pop up here, but uh, that is the idea here. Okay, so that's all I am doing at line 26. Again, the this pointer is a little bit weird, uh, but again, just remember that represents the current instance of the object. And otherwise, the rest of the assignment looks pretty much the same. All right, so let's go ahead and just run this code and see what it prints out. So I've got my uh, main function below here, and basically all I'm doing is including this array and maybe some handy things for later, and just going to construct one of these arrays here and name it array one. Okay, so let's go ahead and compile. And looks like it compiles, and if I run it, you will see array one was constructed and array two was destructed or destroyed. And similarly, if I were to uh, create int array, array two, and assign it to array one, go ahead and make your predictions what's going to happen. We should see at least one constructor called here, and then this is being, 
well, copy constructed. So let's go ahead and see that. So array one was constructed. Then our array two was copy constructed from array one. It doesn't have any names, so that's why there's just a blank spot here. And then each of these arrays was destroyed. And since array two is a copy of array one, we see array one essentially being destroyed twice, although maybe we should append to the name array one copy. So I'll just go ahead and do that to make this a little bit easier plus copy. Okay, and let's just go ahead and rerun this one more time. And I suppose in this sense, they will not be true copies, but we'll be able to distinguish them. And you can see again, array one copy was destroyed, array one uh, copy, uh, the original array one was then destroyed. All right, so there we go here. So um, let's just go ahead and move these parentheses in here just to be a little bit more clear. And I'll rerun that one more time. And now you can see that, again, the array one copy, that's this thing, was destroyed. Now, notice the order here. This is something we haven't really talked about, but I think is useful in perhaps your C++ interviews to see that the order that these objects were constructed, array one first, then array two, they are destroyed in reverse order. So last in is the first one out or last object allocated, which is this array one copy. That's array two will be the first one out or first one destroyed. OK, so just something to keep in mind. OK, so what's new here? Well, what I want to talk about is this idea that's of importance at line eight when we're making copies. Now, recall this is one of these situations where we make a copy, so copy made. There could be other situations. For example, if I write some function here, say foo, and I just create some array here, and I'll just call it temp. Well, this would be an instance where if I run this program, and let me go ahead and uh, comment out this line here. And if I just call this function here, foo with array one, well, let's go ahead and see what happens. So when I run this, well, we can go ahead and see that another copy was made because we have passed by value semantics in C++, which means when this function foo is called, we get a copy of array one that is passed in. And we can do things to prevent that by using, say, pass by reference or so on. But what happens if we do other things in our program? So for example, what if I also were to just create an array here, maybe some results, and then maybe I want to return that result here. Well, and let's make sure that we have the array type here. And let's see if I just call uh, foo, as is shown here. And whoops, let's go ahead and make sure that I give this a name here for our extractor. So from, uh, let's just call this foo created array, just so we know where it's coming from. And I'll go ahead and compile it and run it. And well, we can see array one was constructed. Then foo created array was constructed here, and then it's destroyed when it leaves scope of this function. So that seems obvious. We are making this actual uh, instance here of constructing this object, but we probably want to do something more useful with foo. So for example, what if I was to say, okay, I want to have another int array, array two, and set it equal to, well, foo, because it's constructing this result here that I want to store somewhere. So let me go ahead and get rid of uh, array one. I'll just uh, comment that out so it doesn't obfuscate our code too much. And I'll run it, and we can see that the foo created array was constructed, and foo created array was destroyed. Now, this here is particularly interesting to me because, well, I didn't see, for instance, any sort of, and you know, I'll go ahead and run and compile this again, any sort of copy constructor being called because, well, wasn't this object created in some sort of way here, right? We've seen that this should be constructed. Shouldn't there be some other copy constructor here? And the truth is that C++ and most compilers are pretty good at optimizing and saying, hey, you really did not have to reconstruct this resource. So maybe by some compiler magic or whatever, we just did not have to recopy and create this object and so on. It just said, hey, you have this resource. We've gone through this work. We can clearly see that you're just assigning it to array two. So this is something that's often known as a sort of 
return value optimization where we can just store the results here. Now, where does this get into the rule of five though? And the rule of five really has to deal with these other two types of special member functions that we can create a move constructor and a move assignment operator. And that has to do with or is relating to this idea here where we don't want to just keep making copies of our objects. We can avoid calling the copy constructor uh, sometimes if we have a move constructor where we just want to, in a sense, steal or transfer resources. So let's go ahead and take a look at what these look like. So I have prepared them here. And the move constructor here, which I call a move constructor policy because I don't have to define these uh, particular member functions. And the C++ compiler won't automatically generate them for me, but it's generally a good idea that I do define them or have a policy. And my policy could be as simple, for example, as just saying, hey, this doesn't exist or isn't allowed. So I could just delete it here in one line and be done with it. But for this example, of course, we want to see how this works. So I have defined these. And if I go ahead to my C++ implementation file here, let me go ahead and show you the actual implementation of my move constructor here. So here it is. And what you're going to notice first that's different is int array and then two ampersands. So this is an R value reference. Again, if you need to, you can check out the playlist in this series to find a little bit more about L value and R value references and so on in C++. But the basic idea is that we are stealing or transferring over resources. So let me go ahead and illustrate this for you again if this is a uh, refresh of a topic. So recall that our int array, that is the thing that we have here on the uh, left side. In memory, we have m name and we have m data. Okay. Uh, an m name stores a string, so it you know points to some memory wherever we can store a string. You know we've had things like array one, and m data stores some chunk of you know ten integers here. So zero through nine here. And that's essentially what it looks like. These are essentially some container data structure here. That's a string from the standard library and our array here. Okay. Int array. Now, if I were to create another object here and I'll call this um, int array, oops. And basically uh, what we have here is again some other object here with m name and m data and i'll just call this the second one here and if i want to move construct this again this means that i want basically to grab this resource and grab this resource and again it's a transfer of ownership so that means that this first int array no longer points to this array here and this no longer points to the string maybe it just points to empty string or whatever but that's the basic idea so i've transferred ownership or moved all of this data into this object and this object essentially has neither ownership of these and it's relatively clear to see with the pointer here where i am redirecting m data instead of to here i am grabbing the m data from this object and just pointing it here OK, so keep that in mind as we look through this code as just a reminder of what move semantics is doing. And in a sense, when we do this transfer, we are changing the lifetime of these objects here or their scope because now they're tied to int array two. OK, so let's actually look at the code so we can see how this works. So in our move constructor here, where I am move constructing from some source, you can again think of this as the right hand side if you like, but I am saying, okay, the name is equal to whatever the name is, and then I essentially just zero out the source here, okay? And then for the data, I point to whatever data the source had, and then I set the source's data to null pointer, because now the resource is owned by the current instance of the class. And the move assignment operator, you're going to see pretty much the same exact thing here. Well, I do a check because I'm not constructing this object. It already exists, but I'm doing some move assignment. So I make sure it's not the same thing as the source. And then I move the resources. Okay. And then I do almost exactly the same thing.
Okay, so let's go ahead and see how this works in practice by just creating some uh, objects here. So let's say I just create array one here and um, let me go ahead and uh, clear this out. Well, I'm going to actually need a little bit more of a resource here and a common way that I'm going to uh, do this is just by creating, say, a vector of our int arrays. So my arrays here. Okay, so let's go ahead and perhaps have a loop here for i equals zero, i less than uh, 10, uh, i plus plus. And commonly we might do something like this. So we'll have our int array and I'll just call this um, temp here and we should give it a name here. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and just name each of these i just so we can see um, what the actual name is here. And uh, then what I want to do is push these back into our my arrays structure. So push back our temp here. Okay, so let's see what happens here. And just thinking about this code, well, this line here at 14, I am constructing a new object. So I need to call it the constructor and then I'm pushing back this object. So let's go ahead and see what actually happens here. So I'm going to compile this. I'm going to run it here. And well, what do we see here? Well, I've got to scroll up a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more and even more here to where we started. And we'll see, okay, the zeroth object was constructed here. And then there was a copy constructor called, okay. And then zero was destructed, okay. So that was this temp object. And we sort of just keep repeating this actual dance here where I keep making copies of temp here and pushing it back by making another copy. And then I destroy the actual temporary. And then I construct another object here, that's temp. And then I say, okay, there was something that was uh, copy constructed from one. And then I repeat. And there's this also a very weird thing where something else was copy constructed. Now, why did that happen? Why are there more copies being made when I push back? Well, remember, vector is a dynamically sized data structure, so we don't actually know how large this is supposed to be. And well, within the actual vector, there are copies being made and we're moving things around. So let me try to get rid of a little bit of the noise here and show you a little bit of trick here. And what I'm actually going to do is just say my arrays dot reserve 10. Okay, because, well, I'm only going to have 10 objects here. But let's go ahead and continue our example. And that'll get rid of a little bit of the noise with the resizing, hopefully, of the vector here. So if I run this, well, again, what we're going to see here is zero was constructed then copy constructed, then destroyed. One was constructed, copy constructed, destroyed. Two was constructed, was copy constructed, then destroyed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what is the actual cost of this program by constantly calling these copy constructors? Well, I can somewhat measure this using Valgren, for example. And if I run this, I'm going to see that there were 23 allocations, maybe some for the vector, maybe some for reserving, and then, you know, all the copies here of temp and then pushing back and then maybe something else just for the program. So about 23 allocations. That can be a measurement and we can sort of see how copies were being made by passing them into this pushback function. Okay, so what was the bother or why did we go through the effort of writing this move constructor? Well, let's actually try to use it. So instead, what I'm gonna actually do is instead of doing this copy constructor, what if I just type in standard move here. And that's going to force this temp here to essentially act as a R value reference so that we'll actually call, well, is it going to be the move constructor or move assignment? Uh, well, let's go ahead and just see if it was move constructed. So I'll go ahead and save this. And again, this is a modern C++ feature. So make sure you're compiling with modern C++ and it works. And if I run it, well, let's go ahead and see what happens. We'll see that zero was constructed 
and zero was move constructed. And then one was constructed, one was move constructed. Um, okay, it looks like about the same amount of things were printed out here. But let's try to measure the actual allocations. So again, with Valgren, which is a program on Linux where you can measure these types of things, this time I'll see that there were 10 less allocations. And this is sort of the whole point of the video, um, to see that by move constructing our objects, once I have done that allocation one time, so that is right here at line 15, why not just go ahead and transfer the resources over to our vector? Because I've already said, hey, I've got 10 of these here. Okay, um, so that is huge here. We are avoiding 10 copies of this data structure, and this could be a very big data structure. Instead, we're saying, hey, don't go through copying everything, just move it. And let's actually look at the code for a moment here. Move constructor is just doing some assignments. So yes, there is some cost here where I'm saying, okay, I've got to actually end up doing a copy of this string. Maybe that's not the best thing, but at least for this um, pointer here, I'm just reassigning the pointer, which is a relatively cheap operation. Versus our copy constructor, where I was making those objects, I was saying, okay, do this full thing, copy. Okay, print off this, allocate some memory from the heap, which can be quite expensive. I have to search the heap, see where the free memory is, and do all these sort of things. And then element by element, or whatever your data structure is, even if this is efficient, and we can do it in a constant operation, this still takes some time to do, even just for the allocation, and so on and so on. So this is the idea with the move constructors and move assignment uh, operators, this idea that we can construct our objects much more quickly. Now, I did do something uh, here with the uh, reserve here. So you're maybe skeptical and saying, well, Mike, you know, you did that trick. So let's go ahead and just get rid of that. And let's go ahead and recompile. Let's go ahead and rerun with Valgren. And well, okay, so this time I see 36 allocations if I am doing things with the move constructor. Let's go ahead and um, this time get rid of the move constructor and just put in temp and go ahead and rerun this and 52 allocations. Okay, so either way, even if you don't know about this little trick here about reserving the memory ahead of time, we can see that when we're not using move semantics versus when we are, so let me undo this, 52 before allocations. And if I rerun this, only 36. And if I get a little bit more intelligent here by reserving approximately however many objects that I think I'm going to store in this vector, then I can get this down to 13 allocations. So again, from 52, our worst case down to 13, that's four times as fast by using move construction. All right, so let me go ahead and wrap this up. I think this is, or I hope this is an interesting example where you can see the motivation of why the rule of five is important and why we need to think about if I have a custom constructor, destructor, copy constructor, and so on, that I need to probably have a policy that is either choose to define a move constructor or move assignment operator or choose not to. In this case where I can clearly see I can get a performance, especially if I'm pushing these objects into data structures or maybe calling this in other functions like we were doing above here, it can be a big win. And I don't have to rely on the compiler to do this sort of magic return value optimization where it's sort of guessing and saying, oh yeah, you are using the resource there. Um, so we don't have to make our compilers work uh, harder in that sense. So folks, I hope this was an interesting lesson. I hope you learned a little bit something about this rule of five and these new uh, features that are in modern C++. Again, you don't get the move constructor or move uh, assignment uh, operator defined for you. That is something that you have to do in your actual code. But again, if you have a modern code base, it's probably a good idea to think about if you need these policies and you can try to write a little benchmark like I did for your perhaps pushing a bunch of these structures into a vector to see what kind of performance gain that you can get. All right, so folks, if you found this lesson useful, make sure that you like and subscribe. We're going to continue talking about classes and a bunch of other fun stuff in C++ in future lessons. I hope you've been enjoying the series. Let me know in the comments below, and we'll see you next time.